As dentists, we don't primarily treat headaches, but we can manage the power function. Now, you'd be amazed about how many patients have stopped taking analgesics after I prescribed these sorts of appliances. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 41 of the Petrusa Dental Podcast. This is the fourth one, I think, uh, for Splint Timber. We've already covered uh, which is the best dental appliance. So that was like the G-Splint theory. Uh, we also covered some basic TMD anatomy and the weakest link theory. I talked in the last episode about why Michigan splints are totally overrated. And now this episode, we're gonna focus on anterior only appliances. Now, if I didn't piss enough dentists off already from my last episode about uh, Michigan appliances being overrated, uh, this is bound to lose me some more fans, I guess. Uh, but hey, the truth must come out because anterior appliances are ones that dental school taught me never to go near. Like these are evil, evil appliances. Don't make anterior only appliances because catastrophic things will happen and you will get sued and you will lose your license and you will be begging on the streets forever and ever. So. This um, episode, I hope, will, will restore your faith in anterior own appliances when correctly prescribed. And this part one just really is the, the basic overview, what the functions are, what the mechanics are, and what records you need to make an anterior only appliance. There are lots of different types of these appliances on the market, some by type of design, some are branded. For example, most common ones are something like a, a B-Splint, NTI or SCI or MCI, same thing, different branding. Uh, there's also called uh, the FOSS, the Flexi Orthotic Splint, which is pretty cool, the Bite Soft, uh, an E-Splint, which is called a U-Bank Splint, a Dawson B-Splint, which is pretty much a B-Splint, a dual arch version of these, uh, and it, you know, the list goes on and on and on. There's many different types, but the umbrella term that all these appliances, these anterior only segmental appliances come under is called an anterior midpoint stop appliance. So how about, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna call these appliances AMPSs. So if I say AMPSs, you now know what I mean. So we're gonna talk about AMPSs. Now, this is actually the appliance that I wear every night and it's, for me, it's a protective and palliative appliance. Like I feel better, I feel more relaxed uh, and it also protects my teeth against the force of power function. So for that's the role it has for me. Uh, I guess what I wanna say before we dive right in is this episode I want to talk about each individual appliance, but I'm gonna save that for the next episode because it will just flow better. But if you're looking for photos, like a lot of you are listening to me right now uh, while you're driving or while you're gardening, uh, and you won't, you won't get the visuals that I'll eventually show. So what I'm gonna do is all the different splints I discuss, I'm gonna show you what they look like and how they work. Uh, and hopefully I'll stick a few videos on as well, uh, on the Protrusive Dental Community Facebook group, which is a private group. It's my way of making sure that no members of the public and patients come in, it's just dentists only and especially those who listen to podcasts. Uh, and um, once, once you join that, if you're not already part of it, you'll see all the different splints I talk about. So, so that's where I'll be posting all the videos and, and images of different splints. Uh, if you haven't already listened to episode eight, please listen to episode eight. It is called, um, do AMPSs cause AOBs? So do these anterior midpoint stop appliances, do they cause anterior open bites? And that was with one of my mentors, Dr. Barry Glassman. It's really insightful episode uh, all about this basically we did some myth busting uh, i guess i'll have to because uh, if you haven't listened to it i'll have to summarize it very briefly in, in this episode but it's well worth a listen especially if you want to get deeper and deeper into these appliances the protrusive dental pearl today will make more sense if you listen to the last episode where i talked a little bit about the lateral pterygoid muscle so the pearl i want to give you is any patient who has a history of joint issues, let's call it, so something that's perhaps intra-articular, clicking joints, uh, and you're gonna be doing some restorative care or even extractions, uh, anything that will involve them opening their mouth for a long time, it is really, really important that you give them a mouth prop on the, on the adjacent side or the contralateral side because the function of the lateral pterygoid is to keep your mouth open. Now, a lot of these patients you'll realize who are parafunctional, when you're doing work on them, you realize that they start closing and you're like, can you, can you please open up again? And they keep closing and you keep nudging them. Can you please open up again? These very annoying patients. Uh, and it's basically because their muscles are already in a, in a state of, of, of being tired. You know, they're already overworked at night, they're parafunctional uh, and they struggle to, to keep open and their jaw gets tired and they start getting pain. And it's basically the lateral pterygoids hurting because it's already so knackered, right? So what can you do? If you give them a mouth prop, it allows them to relax. They no longer have to stretch open the whole time. They can 
relax into it. It gives an opportunity to, uh, for the lateral pterygoid to have a break and it also prevents the muscle going into spasm because what happens if it, if it goes into spasm, it will pull the disc even more forward and then they might have a lock jaw, as in a, a closed lock. Uh, and that's not a nice situation to be in straight after a dental procedure. Maybe this has happened to you before, after root canal or lung procedure, that your patients um, are unable to sort of, uh, once they're closed together, they're unable to open again uh, because they're, or they're feeling a lot of uh, tenderness or pain on one side. So it's a great thing to do for anyone with a history of internal derangement to give them a mouth prop because it will help the lateral pterygoid. So that's a, the very relevant protrusive dental pearl I have for you today. So back to AMSIS. This appliance is actually condemned by some dentists because they believe, and, and this is very principally, um, fundamentally what they believe, is basically because it's an anterior only appliance, they believe that it will act as a dial appliance whereby it will cause the posterior teeth to over erupt or perhaps uh, a degree of dental alveolar compensation and therefore your patient will get an anterior open bite. So that's the, the main sort of, um, those, those people who are against anterior appliances, that's their main argument that yes, it causes AOBs and we want none of it. So that's their main argument. But really, I'm going to do a bit of myth busting following on from episode eight that actually that's not quite accurate. Two reasons. One is that your patients who you give an anterior midpoint stop appliance to, they only wear it in their sleep. Now, if our patients are only supposed to touch their teeth for 17 minutes a day, and maybe about three and a bit minutes at nighttime only, on average, based on some studies, then really, they're only really missing out on three minutes of teeth contact per day for the non-parafunctional patient. For the parafunctional patient, it's a, it's a godsend, this appliance, because their teeth are no longer rubbing together. But because they're only wearing it for maximum, you know, eight, nine hours at night time, then really that's not enough time for a dial effect to take place. And number two is that this sort of dial effect, it actually requires bony deposition, i.e. you the, the body needs to lay down some alveolar bone to allow the posterior teeth to sort of um, over erupt or compensate. And really this this needs more time. You can't achieve this in eight hours per night. Ask any orthodontist. So this is a fundamentally flawed concept that you get a, a dial type effect and it's really false. And if, you're, if you've been afraid of this appliance for that reason, then, then don't be. But you can still get an AOB, not from the dial effect. Uh, that's why I was very careful to say uh, you don't get an AOB from the dial effect, but you can get an AOB in any appliance. You can get a, an AOB from a Michigan appliance. One of my patients, believe it or not, she came to me with a posterior only appliance, which should in theory cause posterior intrusion and a posterior open bite, but she came to me with an anterior open bite. Uh, you can definitely get AOBs in any sort of appliance. And the mechanism for that is nothing to do with the dial effect. It's called condylar repositioning, and that's the most common theory. I'm just gonna go into that a little bit now. So remember back to the last episode where I talked about the lateral pterygoid muscle deprogramming. Imagine we deprogrammed your lateral pterygoid muscles, those poor little stressed out uh, positioner muscles, these super muscles are tired the whole time, keeping your condyle in the correct place so you don't keep crashing into your uh, centric relation contact point, uh, and also doing power functions, working really hard, uh, and, and now, we manage to deprogram it. Let's say we give you an appliance, any appliance, and this deprograms your lateral pterygoid. Now, what happens is that when you remove the appliance, the lateral pterygoid forgets how you used to bite together. And because it forgot how it used to bite together, and it really likes this new situation, it, it doesn't miss the tension and the stress of the old position, it's now relaxed, and you know what? It's happy that it forgot the, the old position, and now the muscles are suddenly relaxed. And the consequence is that actually you've forgotten how to bite together. And because you forgot how to bite together, you just bite together on your back teeth, and maybe now you have an anterior open bite. This is a real uh, gross simplification of the process, but essentially the best way to remember it is that your muscles forget how you bite together, and this is called uh, deprogramming or an anterior open bite due to condylar repositioning. There are a few more theories about how this actually works and a few other accessory theories about the other causes of AOBs with respect to splints, 
But let's just go with this one because it's the most simple one and it's the most common one actually. So you essentially forget how you bite together. You can actually predict which patients are likely or a higher risk of getting an AOB. Whenever I'm prescribing these anterior only appliances, in my notes I'm writing whether my patient in front of me is low risk or high risk of an AOB. And there's certain traits. For example, if you've got someone with a ridiculously deep uh, overbite, they're not the ones in it who are going to come in with an AOB. Just accept it because if you can suddenly miraculously treat all these uh, very deep bite pa uh, patients non-surgically and suddenly take them from here to an AOB, you're a miracle worker. It's not going to happen, right? So there's certain occlusal traits, there's certain uh, features of their dental anatomy, which will mean that they're more likely to have an AOB. And you can predict it, and then you can write in your notes, uh, in your notes low risk or high risk, and I'll go into that in the next episode. The best way to figure out how anterior only appliances work is, uh, you know in the last episode where I talked about anterior guidance uh, and the benefits uh, of anterior guidance, i.e. being furthest away from the TMJ hinge and switching off the muscles? That's essentially how anterior only appliances work. That's how AMPSs work. They switch off the anterior temporalis muscles from proprioception and also they're far away from the TMJ hinge. What does that actually mean? Well, let's do a little test, a little experiment. If you're hopefully not driving and you're able to do this, if you can get yourself a clean COVID-free pencil or something like that, uh, or if you're in the clinic, uh, get some cotton rolls, get a couple to disclude your back teeth basically. So you put your pencil uh, in your front teeth or around about your uh, incisors or the cotton roll at your incisors, uh, and I want you to put your fingers by your anterior temporalis, and I want you to squeeze together with the pencil or the cotton rolls in place uh, and feel the contraction, feel the contraction of your muscles. Now, do the same thing without the pencil or without the cotton rolls there and notice the difference. You'll notice that your anterior temporalis muscle can contract significantly harder when your back teeth are touching. And that's essentially how the appliance works. The muscles can switch off uh, and if your back teeth are no longer crashing against each other, then they're gonna be happy. The PDL is gonna be happy. You may actually get improvement in sensitivity if that was um, also uh, due to some parafunctional issues. Uh, you're not gonna be uh, breaking restorations anymore because the teeth aren't touching anymore. Sometimes I've had patients with uh, headaches, tension type headaches, uh, and, I, and I gave them an appliance like this for, for muscle reasons and per perhaps protective reasons, uh, and they come back and, and they tell me how their headaches have improved, and they're taking far less analgesics and ibuprofen because of this appliance, now they're no longer getting their headaches, or it's significantly reduced, which is, which is great to hear. But remember guys, we as dentists cannot treat and should not treat headaches, right? I always tell my patients, I'm not someone who treats headaches, I treat parafunction. And even then, I don't treat it. You still parafunction, I just manage the forces so that they're now directed somewhere which is safer and better and not damaging your joint or not damaging your muscles. Uh, so that's the idea and some of these patients will actually get a secondary benefit, i.e. their headaches will get better. In fact, the funny thing is there's a website called solvemyheadache.com and this is not a website for some analgesics or a massage therapy program. It's actually for a splint. It's a splint I quite commonly use. It's called the FOS appliance, F-O-S, Flexi Orthotic Splint. Uh, and it's the, it's the sort of the patient facing website uh, marketing the FOS, um, which only a dentist can prescribe. So it's not like they can buy it themselves, but it's, it's a great concept, you know, they found out that um, these sorts of appliances, your SCIs, NTIs, MCIs, uh, FOSS appliances, they really help a lot of patients with their tension headaches. But as tempting as it is, you shouldn't promise your patients anything to do with headaches. Don't even go, don't even go there. Just tell them all with headaches that they need to get uh, an official diagnosis from their GP. You are going to treat the problem that you see in front of you, which is worn teeth, parafunctional, myofacial pain, you're not there specifically to treat headaches, but you might get a positive benefit. The other way to think about these appliances is, you know that patient um, where you want to check their guidance, right? You want to check, are they canine guided? Are they group function? What's going on? Uh, and you tell them, can you please grind to the right? Uh, and they tell you, yes, I'm trying. And they're really just, they're locked in position and the mandible can't move because the interlocking of their teeth is so good, it's so well meshed together. The, the inclines of their cusps are so steep and they just can't move. And, and, and you think, how is this possible? They're clearly power functioning and going into those movements at nighttime because their canines are really worn. So you think, what's going on here? They're locked in. Now, 
What locking in does is that increases resistance in your muscles. Therefore, when you give an anterior only appliance and they're able to skate around freely, you suddenly reduce resistance. You've actually really helped these muscles in a way that uh, an analogy I can give you is imagine you're lifting some really heavy weights, right? And your muscles are, are, are working overdrive and they're working really hard to lift these weights. And now suddenly you decrease these weights by about 75%. Those next few reps, they're gonna be really easy. It's gonna be like as if all the resistance has been removed. And you can imagine your muscles will be in a happier position. So that's another way to think about how these muscles uh, do work and how beneficial they can be for your patients. Those are the mechanisms of actions and really the indications for this AMSA type of appliance is when you have a myofacial or a muscular diagnosis, you got these tension headaches which you don't, you're not treating because they're tension headaches, but you're really treating the signs of power function and you want to protect them from further wear. You may have a situation where you have a, a tooth that's hurting or you're getting some sensitivity and you just can't explain it. And you think, could it be because they're power functioning and that's the cause of it? Now, by giving an anterior only appliance, if the pain goes away, then you can to some degree of confidence agree that perhaps it was the appliance or the change or the existing occlusion or the occluding scheme that was the cause of the pain in the first place. So it can be used diagnostically. Of course, anterior only appliances are fantastic deprogrammers, so far better than Michigan appliances uh, or tanners. So definitely a, a strong indication for anterior only appliances. Anytime you're doing a rehabilitation and you want to deprogram them, it's a great appliance to give them to just reset all the muscles, get everything relaxed, so you can get a predictable centric relation recording. So those are the sort of general types of um, indications. I guess a uh, contraindication will be joint issues. And what I mean by joint issues is someone who can't uh, bear load on their joints, someone who's got severe pain, uh, and, and really, if you give someone an anterior only appliance, uh, when they bite really hard together, uh, yes, the, the splint at the front is absorbing some load, and therefore, the PDL at the front is absorbing some load, but all the other uh, load, if you like, is, is being directed to, this is the theory, by the way, to the, the TMJ. And if you have got an unhealthy, symptomatic area with lots of inflammation, uh, um, where your condyle may be impinging on what we call retrodiscal tissue. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm getting a bit too deep into this, but really if it's a primary joint issue, uh, then this is not the ideal appliance. However, some of my mentors will disagree with that and they say, you know what, you can get away with a lot and very few patients have true joint issues that they will not be able to accept an anterior only appliance. But if you're starting out with this appliance, try and uh, stay away from joint related issues and try and target patients with more of the muscular symptoms, which actually is 90% of our uh, quote unquote TMD patients, right? Um, how many patients, like I said a few episodes ago, come in with raging TMJ pain? Very few, primarily we're managing asymptomatic patients, thankfully. Now, uh, having said that, if it, it could be a diagnostic event for you if you give someone an anterior only appliance uh, and they come back with raging pain from their, their temporomandibular joint, which by the way, has never happened to me, uh, but that's supposed to be pathognomonic for someone who's got a primary joint issue and perhaps you need to change your appliance to give them some quote unquote joint support. Now, again, some dentists feel very strongly against what I'm saying here, but I'm just giving you uh, the theory that's out there. And of course, you can also use AMPSs as protective appliances, but really there are some other appliances which uh, and cheaper and easier and simpler appliances which that you may wish to use as a protective appliance. I'll go into a little bit more of that into part two. So now we know what AMPSs do and when they're indicated and potentially when they're contraindicated. And now you know that they don't cause AOBs due to the dial effect, but you can get an AOB from any appliance uh, in certain patients who have certain traits, right? So I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more detail next episode, hopefully, uh, and throughout Splint Timber where I can and on the Petrusa Dental community. But now you know all that, let's just talk about, before we, before we go, uh, about the records you need for this type of appliance. Now, ideally, if you're starting out, you should be taking gold standard records A to Z. So the first record I take is the following. This is something that was taught to me by one of my mentors, Dr. Michael Melkers, right? Uh, it's when you use a leaf gauge, 
and I'll probably be playing a video of this as I'm saying this to help you understand this. I'll be using a leaf gauge at the front uh, and I'll be dialing it down to find the first point of contact uh, within centric relations, so that centric relation contact point. And essentially, this shows me that if this program, uh, if this patient was to deprogram, what would their occlusion look like? And if their muscles were to forget how to uh, get back into their normal bite again, what would they potentially look like? So would they end up with an AOB? Would they not? Uh, how would this look? Would the patient even realize? Uh, and what you do is you take a photo of the patient with the leaf gauge in place at the position where the first point of contact is. Now, if it's only a couple of leaves and they've got enough of an overbite, then really they're low risk. But if they've got a shallow overbite, quite worn teeth uh, and quite a big slide, and they're more likely, therefore, to get an AOB from any appliance that you do, then that's the one you want to take a photo for and show them as part of your consent. Then you basically have to figure out, is your why big enough to continue with this appliance? Does the patient understand the consequences? They, will they understand that they may not be able to bite into sellotape again, that they may miss the ham from their sandwiches? And is the juice worth the squeeze? Because for a lot of these patients who are suffering a lot, they don't care about this bite change, they just want a solution. Uh, and at least you've predicted it and you told them ahead of time. But I can reassure you now that these patients are, are, are not too common and I don't wanna scare you, but it'd be irresponsible for me not to tell you this. Uh, so that's the first thing I do, uh, and that's a hat tip to Dr. Michael Melkers, who taught me to do this. Now, of course, you know already uh, what Dr. Michael Melkers doesn't know about occlusion in splints is frankly not worth knowing. Uh, and as you know, he is supposed to come to London in May uh, for occlusion 2020. And of course, due to COVID, we had to reschedule that to November. Now, uh, a massive update I'm about to give you is that the event is still happening, but we're turning the event completely virtual. Uh, it's gonna be occlusion 2020 live online two days full access to Dr. Michael Mokers, uh, full immersion into full mouth rehab from single tooth, building up to full mouth rehab and splints. So if you wanna see these protocols and slides and cases in, in a lot more depth, join us for this online version uh, in the comfort of your own living room or office or bedroom or in your PJs or whatever. Like before, I was describing this event as occlusion and lamb chops, and now I guess I have no option but to say occlusion and PJs, right? So uh, join us for occlusion and PJs. Uh, I've reduced the price to 389 pounds because we're no longer having a venue. Now that fee of 389 pounds is a massive, massive steal compared to the 1.5K that I paid when I went to see Dr. Michael Melkers in, in Stockholm in 2018. So join us for two days, full online immersion uh, into all things occlusion, uh, everything that was promised at Occlusion 2020, but now in the comfort of your own home because frankly, COVID is really getting a little bit concerning. So uh, I didn't wanna pull the plug on the event because so many people are excited. I'm getting emails and messages all the time. So we're still hoping to run a really educational two days. So come and join us. You can go to occlusion2020.com to sign up. By the time this episode comes out, uh, I probably would have made the ticket sales live again. The date once more is 27th and 28th of November 2020, live online, two days with Dr. Michael Milk. Let's get back on track now. So we, that was basically what Michael Melkus taught me, which was the, the bite record of if your patient was to get an AOB, would that happen? What would they look like? And then show your patient that photo. That's the first record. It's a good screening thing to do to see if the patient in front of you is high or low risk of getting an AOB after your anterior only appliance. The second record I take is to measure the lateral excursions, protrusive and retrusive. Uh, and the reason to do this is Medico-legally, it's a good thing to do before you give any appliance so that if in the future the patient says, oh, I, I'm no longer able to move my jaw left and right, whereas actually you've probably improved their, their function uh, and you've improved their um, ability to move left and right, but if you have some measurements, you can objectively back that up, right? So what I use is a, a perio probe, like a Williams probe, uh, and I measure from the upper midline to the lower midline and I get the patient to grind all the way to one side and I measure the sort of uh, distance and then you either add or subtract based on if they have a midline uh, deviation. If they have a midline deviation, obviously you need to add or remove a couple of millimeters depending on which side they're going to. And essentially, you make a, a note of this in the patient's records and you can send that as part of your lab work as well. So the lab knows what their range of, of, of movement is. 
The next thing, of course, is a, a record of the patient's jaw, so i.e. an impression or some digital scans. Ideally, if you're taking impressions, take PVS. It's just better quality uh, and less chance of distortion of the alginate, for example. Uh, just be mindful of getting these drags. Uh, technicians uh, hate these drags that you can get, so make sure your impression technique is good. So you want to send some impressions. You want to send the measurements. You want to uh, screen the patient, like I said, for a potential AOB. Uh, you don't need a FACEBO. You know, you don't need a Facebook because at the end of the day, it's just biting at the front. So really these appliances are quite easy to adjust and a Facebook is just not necessary. You don't even need a centric relation bite because when the patient bites together, they'll eventually get centric um, quite easily. They'll deprogram very efficiently. So you don't need any fancy bite records. Very few scenarios you might, and we might touch upon that next episode, but generally, that's all you need. So I hope you found part one very useful there. I just gave you uh, some indications and uh, which records you need and a bit of background about uh, AMPSs and why they're potentially frowned upon and why these dentists who frown upon them maybe don't have the best argument because really it can't cause an AOB due to a dial effect. Now, in part two, I'm going to cover some of these appliances and, and put them up against each other. Like, why would you choose one type of AMPSA over another, uh, which is the best answer, perhaps we can cover that. I'm gonna talk about decisions you have to make in upper arch versus lower arch versus dual arch. So you can get dual arch answers as well and, and when would that be indicated? I'll share with you how many of my patients have developed AOBs, which splints were responsible for those and how I manage those patients. And I'll even tell you when an AMSA may be overkill and maybe there may be simpler appliances like a, a soft bite guard can you believe I just said that? Uh, and we'll talk about that in the next episode. So thanks so much for listening all the way to the end and join me in part two of uh, Understanding Amps. Uh, and I'm hoping you're enjoying Splintember. Thank you so much for tuning in.